Uh, very well, welcome to Caps Wars 3.0. I am your host for this evening. Well, I'll have my co host in just a little bit. Uh, Eastern Cody will join me. But right now, Caps Wars 3.0 is starting off with a trip to Suffolk to speak with a season ticket holder from Bruce Dortmund. Because a couple of weeks ago, myself and Andrew, um, we had a discussion after the PSG Borussia match. Both of us <laughs> like Borussia Dortmund. We love the way they play. We love the atmosphere. Of course, the fans, the support, the stadium, the way they have rebuilt themselves, built themselves, recovered from quite a few knocks that they've taken. However, we did annoy some Borussia fans only because we're saying that we didn't like the way the media was treating them and that we should, you know, they should play fair. And of course, it, was, it wasn't we were supporting PSG, heaven forbid, we were basically just talking about uh, how the media was misrepresenting and actually doing Borussia wrong. Now, of course, after we have a chat with our uh, season ticket holder, we're going to go to Isil Cody because we have more on Garcia, Adeleke, and a little bit more as well about the uh, boxing fights coming up as well. But straight away, this is what um, I'd say will people up the wrong way, but also rightly raise some questions about what we should be talking about as well around football. And media should have a bit of respect for the teams that they discuss. But they have an absolutely incredible youth academy that never really gets much credit. In fact, I'd even go as far to say that Paris as a city is arguably the most exciting city for producing football talent in the world. Look in that lineup. They had Warren Zaire Emery, who's a teenager, and yet he looks like possibly the most experienced midfielder in the Champions League at the moment. Looks so calm on the ball. Bradley Barcola comes on. Um, they they have plenty of youth talent there, but you're not allowed to like them because it's not cool and accepted by the general population. And like you say. <laughs> I, I, I just can't take it seriously anymore. I don't have a problem if people just prefer Borussia Dortmund and there are elements to them that I do like. Jaden Sanchez had a horrific time in England, partly because of his attitude, partly because of how he's been treated as well, I think. You've got to remember this. He looks like he's having fun again, and that is good to see. You know you should dispute that. Um, but uh, the fawning is nauseating now steve the very last bit of that when andrew said the falling is nauseating that people understood that as that we're knocking down Borussia, but as you know we've discussed it it's not the case um Borussia don't get an easy ride from the german uh, media most clubs i remember when, when as i mentioned to you before when we were chatting before this when eintracht beat Borussia on the great escape it was it was such a thrill the fans were celebrating it was great because Borussia was such a big side um, do you think that the media are going over the top on Borussia? Do you think that in a way that they're actually turning people against the club, where they should be actually saying, this club is doing things right, let's respect them and let's support them? Hi, firstly, thanks for having me. Um, I, it's a complicated relationship with the media, I think, for Borussia Dortmund. Um, there's always been high expectations of the club, probably going back... <laughs> Uh, 10, 15 years since the glory days of Klopp. I mean, you have to remember that before that, the, the club were really struggling, nearly went to the wall. And then we went through a series of um, bad management decisions. Um, the squad wasn't good. Then Klopp came in and built this wonderful brand of football. Um, and the whole thing took off. Um, it was always a big club, but kind of the... I guess the media scrutiny and they kind of became everyone's favourite second team. They've struggled since Klopp left, I think it's fair to say. They've gone through a few managers. The playing style hasn't always connected with the fans. And we can see that even now with Aidan Terzic. Um, so this, this season has been quite interesting, I think, because obviously last season we started really badly. Um, and it was only after the winter break that the team started playing well. And ultimately, we should have won the Bundesliga last season. But we were only really top for that last game. But everyone expected the club to win. And then we know what happened on the last day of the season. I think there's been a massive hangover from that um, this season. We saw at the start of the season in the Bundesliga, the team weren't performing. Or that... They were performing, but I think other teams came along. We've got Leverkusen, obviously, who've had the most amazing season. Stuttgart came kind of from nowhere. And so 
the I guess the performance that we've kind of been putting out on a regular basis with Terzic this season hasn't been enough to um, to make a challenge for the Bundesliga. Then we've got the Champions League and it's almost like we're two completely different sides. And I think there's now a kind of swelling of support for the club. And obviously the last German club standing in... Um, in European, in the, I was going to say European competition, the, no, European, no. Cup, the European Cup. So I think that has boosted their popularity a bit. But yeah, I think they're not always the most popular, given credit, that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I, I know myself, I, I, as, as you mentioned, when I was working in um, in Frankfurt, I mean, they had just won, I think it was 97, wasn't it? They won the, the, the Champions yeah. League. Um, again, terrific side. Remember Paul Lambert playing with them, and I mean, they did a really, really good side. And they were dominant in Germany. But in by the time of ninety nine came around, they were already starting to suffer. But there were teams at that time as well. There was a there was a massive, massive financial crunch across Germany. Mm -hmm. um, Kaiser Stadion were hit, us, of course. Uh, you know, Eintracht were, were suffering. Everyone was suffering. All the, the clubs that were sort of building themselves up suddenly started to, to rattle and, and fall back a bit. And um, that was when the dot com bubble burst. Um, and I do remember, you know, speaking with people from from Borussia when I was working with Frankfurt, and they said that in the eighties we won a cup. That was all. There was nothing else. So there was basically Borussia were a team, as you said. They almost went. They almost went to the wall financially. They recovered. They built up, and again, there's a, a huge pride. And that's all to ask. Uh, see how how did you end up following uh, Borussia? Because it's not just following. Because a lot of Irish people will follow to go to the odd match. It might even be season ticket holders, but this is something very, very different and something um, for me is very special. Not only alone do you follow them, but you also go a season ticket holder and then go across as well, and you're part of the family. How does it start? Um, so I was actually born in Germany. Um, my dad was military, but my grandmother's actually from Witten, which is just outside Dortmund. Um, so I spent the first few years of my life. Um, in Dortmund, we moved to Suffolk when I was six or seven years of age. And I always had a place for Dortmund in my heart. And then obviously back then, there wasn't the internet. There wasn't the coverage of the Bundesliga over here in England. So I kind of didn't follow them as much as I do now. Then over time, technology developed. Um, the internet became something um there were cheap flights which like before that before i started going i hadn't even thought about the possibility of getting a flight to dortmund about being able to access tickets those things kind of developed and i was in a stage of my life where i thought do you know what i should go and have a look at dortmund go and watch a game and i did and it was like a homecoming for me if i'm honest and it's kind of developed from there so i've I joined up um, as a member, um, got on the waiting list for a season ticket um, and the season of COVID-19, 2019-2020 was when I got my season ticket after about, I think it must have been over 10 years of waiting. Um, and so I became a season ticket holder. And then a couple of years ago as well, I set up a fan club, Die Nummer 19 fan club uh, for people based in the UK. In saying that, I mean, Borussia have fan clubs. They have one, for example, in Moscow. Um, I think it's and now it, it, it's small, but of course it took off in the 90s when they were you know, a popular team. Of course, mm -hmm. went up again when Klopp was doing well with them after he moved from Mainz. Um, describe the club and describe the kind of family atmosphere. Because again, as we showed at the very, very start, they sang the, the Liverpool anthem, which as a, as a boy born in Germany from Suffolk, you'd sort of, I was always thought you were more of a, a tractor boy, but Singing the Liverpool hymn, shall we say, the Liverpool anthem. It's not just Liverpool, of course, so, but the Liverpool anthem. How does it feel in the club and, and what makes it so special as a club? I think first and foremost, you have to understand Dortmund, the city, and that region of the Ruhrpott. It's very industrial. Um, it was founded on the um, steelworks, the coal mines. There's, there's not much there apart from industry. That's all gone now. 
But if you look at Dortmund as a city, the city lives and breathes for the football club. Everyone is, is a Borussia Dortmund fan in Dortmund. There are no other teams to support. You go there on a match day and everyone is wearing black and yellow because whether they go to the games or not, there is such a connection between the club and between the city. And I think that's a really important part of the family feel. You go to games, you're on, you're on the Zoo Tribuna and you're standing with your friends that you see every couple of weeks. In my case, I don't go over every to every game, maybe um, once every six weeks, I probably make a game over. But I'm with the people I'm always with, my friends who are over there. And it's that real kind of family, that friendship that builds up over time. When, when you first were going across, you know, I mean, you can say, look, I was born here. But of course, we all know it, you know, <laughs> there is that kind of thing. When I lived in Canada, people say that uh, where I lived in Prince Edward Island, if you were born on Prince Edward Island and left one day later and came back at the age 90, you were you know, an islander. If you were born in Halifax and moved over one day old and lived till you're 90, you're, you're from off island. Do you ever get that from, did you get that from um, any of the fans? Do you get it? And how, how did they sort of take in sort of um, outsiders, shall we say, in, in that sense? They're very welcoming. I think um, particularly I notice as well, like I'm with the same group of people the whole time, but I'm in the city um, before games, meeting up with people. And there is a kind of, it's like a destination spot. It's a bucket list ground for a lot of people to go to. And so they're used to, I guess, um, foreigners coming over and sampling the atmosphere. So there is that kind of expectation that it's not all just going to be Germans, but I meet loads of Germans um, when I'm over there, not just the people I go to the game with. You get involved in conversations with them. And then like when I tell them the backstory and the reason I'm there, then they understand that it's a big part of my life. Um, Steve, I have two, two small questions. I know we, we, we won't go too much longer because we have got busy days. But for, first question, um, when, you go to, when you go to games and the atmosphere, do you find it the, the same in other stadiums that you go to visit in Germany or say in England? And what, 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 what makes it special as in just the, the atmosphere? I think German football in itself is extremely special. Um, like I talk to people, I'm connected to people who are Leverkusen fans, um, fans of Haas Val, um, Schalke fans and everyone really really enjoys the atmosphere at these games because I guess in in many respects it's not as regulated as as football in England so you can have a beer on the terraces um, there's not that kind of restriction the the ultras create a really big scene for any club and I think that's kind of really important as well um, and even for big, like, games with fierce rivalries, there doesn't seem to be that kind of level of kind of aggression and we're defending our territory like you maybe get in an England game in a local derby in England where there's, there's quite a, a lot of hostility and extreme rivalry. And I, I don't necessarily think you get that in Germany. I've, I've been to quite a few um other grounds, um, not just to watch Dortmund, but I've been um, to see other matches. And even in really small clubs, there, there's a great atmosphere and a, a kind of a love of the of the game over there, I think. I agree with you on that. And we do know every country has the idiots who follow the football. Every club, doesn't matter how big or small, it's some of the smaller clubs, are worse, they have big, bigger radius because they basically might have I feel have been chased out of bigger clubs, so they, they have nowhere else to go. But at the same time, I agree with you. Where in Germany, I've 
always felt very safe going to 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 a match. Uh, now again, worked in football thirty odd years, so I feel safe wherever I go. But at the same time, uh, it is that kind of like moment where you, you kind of go to a stadium and you do feel mm. calm. And again, having a drink in the game, you probably know as well from from ice hockey as well in Germany. You can sit in your seat, have a have a have a beer. Even it's just this sort of the they trust you as an adult. Mm. And I think that's see, would you say the same as well with the fans that uh yes, there are issues with fan behavior. I remember Haswell, for example, coming down and they were you know chanting at Eintracht fans, Eintracht fans chanting back, calling like you know, gypsies, thieves, HIV, and shouting ha Evo, HIV, round ahead. There is that, but do you think that there's a, a different level compared to English football? I'll even say compared to Irish football, um, and Russian football for sure of control within the fan base there's a kind of like a if someone sees something going on they'll not give a clip in the ear but they'll say come on cop on is it a bit more sort of like self-awareness self-control yeah there is i think like there's a lot of self-regulation particularly um if you look at the ultras um they tend to self-police self-regulate um certainly in dortmund like the ultra groups have a very kind of um there's a lot of social responsibility and understanding of political issues as well. Um, they're very much anti-Nazi. They're very much anti-discrimination. And so if they see anything that is um, right wing or potentially divisive, they will step in and kind of put a halt to that. So there is that kind of policing. And that, I think that goes for um dangerous behavior between opposition fans as well that was what i was looking for self-policing because i think it's, it's extremely important it's something i always said fans need to do it and something i'm building up the world code 2018 here discussing with fan groups and with the organized the local organization organizing committee and saying fans need to take care of themselves it can't be always left to police and stadium officials because they, we know the fans are the quickest to, to put blame on somebody else doesn't matter where they're from, they do. So I don't know, we'll, we'll end off on this. And I just want to say thank you very much. And look, would you come back on and join us again just before the, the Champions League final, before the, the great Borussia win? I would love to. Super. So that, Steve Farmer, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And I don't know, we'll just take a short break and we'll go across straight away to Isol Cody to talk some boxing and some athletics as well. So back after this. Fuck Ryan Garcia, man. I, I mean, I've never liked him anyway, but like you've got to remember, like he was overweight. Like there was a weight limit and he was over it. There's literally a rule to abide by and he broke the rule. And yeah, still they fought, but like, it's just shitty behavior. I mean, fair play, he won, but I mean, there's rumors uh, that he allegedly took uh, steroids or some sort of steroids but look either way fuck him and everything he stands for he's an absolute twat that of course is a man who is never uh, lacking in attention or i should say he is lacking attention that's why he needs lots and lots more of it that is because of course he is speaking about ryan garcia who we've discussed at length this week with myself and andrew Clinton, of course with nate larandi of course i'm not a more this is cow sports 3.0 I'm going to start off with Ryan Garcia. I'm going to bring in our legal eagle, Isol Cody, who's joining us from Dublin. Um, Isol, um, for once, I actually agree with that kind of less than intelligent lad from England. We, uh, I suppose we kind of have to look at YouTubers and go, they're making a lot of money from well, YouTube. So maybe, maybe they're onto something. Um, I think actually, weirdly, I found myself listening to a clip also from another YouTuber turned boxer this week because it was featured on a well-known radio show. They did a clip of his show, so Jake Paul talking with Garcia. It was very interesting because, like, obviously Garcia is going, I didn't do anything, I didn't do anything. And Jake Paul makes the point, but if you did, and, like, it's clear that he actually is very much of the view that, like, if you did this, this is really serious. And there's no kind of... There's no joking in that part of it for him, which I think is important because as much as we like to maybe take a view on YouTubers in boxing, at the end of the day, all we really want is people who are involved in the sport for whatever reason, be they fans, be they participants, be they influencer, YouTuber boxers, to understand that it is a very serious sport. And I think 
when we hear YouTubers in particular who've entered boxing, they go on and on about like, how hard they're training, how much they're doing. And like, we take it with a pinch of salt. But I think there may actually be that level of understanding that this is actually a serious sport. And any form of doping in the sport, of all sports, of anything, combat sports, it's red line game over as far as I'm concerned. And I think with Garcia, we obviously, and I know you've discussed this, but there, there were two strands to it. There was the initial um wild discussion that there was nandrolone found that turned out not to be the case can happen when you re-examine substances um and obviously things can show as very similar to others but there's no dispute in the fact that the osterine was found um which is obviously hormone based as opposed to when we think of steroids and used for particularly in the treatment of women with breast cancer because it helps with tissue growth um ryan garcia has spent the week going i don't know what ostrich is and kind of the joke being yeah, if i yeah. don't know what it is i couldn't possibly know that it shouldn't be in my system or how could i have taken it and the point is as an athlete your responsibility is to know exactly what is in your system and what shouldn't be in your system so you can even cross check it with a list these are all things athletes are meant to do and the quantity or the amount doesn't make and i know i saw rich um pox and during the week going strict liability it doesn't matter what's there and it's something that i think people need to get their heads around if it's in your system it is your responsibility to face a ban and to deal with the consequences if you can show there was a contamination substance if you can do all of that you may still face a ban or you may get obviously you may end up uh, with a position where you're out the other side as a result as a result of showing contamination but you can still have a ban even of course, and, and, substance. you know, it, it is that kind of thing. Same with, with um, when Maria Sharapova was done and she came out and said, oh, we didn't see, we didn't check it. I mean, everyone knew. I remember at the time I, I was coming back from um, the Baltics and I was flying in and there was posters of forever. She was like, she was at the face of like a water brand. Um, mm -hmm. It could have been Evian. And so she was everywhere, everywhere in, in the Baltics and in Europe. And she was huge. But when it was kind of, for me, it was funny because the drugs that she took are manufactured there. And it, it's like, there was some sort of like link with it. But then again, when, when it came out, I remember like asked by friends of mine in tennis saying, um, do you know what's happened with her? Because like, she's in big trouble, big trouble. She's not, people who knew her from playing like a Fed Cup with her. So, but there's something myself and Andrew discussed the other day, and this is what we think. I'm just trying to think of what comes to mind <laughs> when you come to our discussion. My apologies, we actually cracked up literally. We were losing our minds thinking of how often Dopers use excuse of what excuse do they use? Look, look, we've gone through we, so many. Here we go. When the, straight away, I don't have it in my system. Must have been contaminated supplements. Uh, I was kissing a girl. I was kissing a guy. Uh, you know, I had three beers and then had sex with my wife uh, three times that night because she deserved it. And that's why I had a high level of testosterone, which helped me to run faster. That's good. That is an excuse, by the way. That is an excuse. Um, you know, I was making pasta where my mother would <laughs> be like, oh my God, my mother was using these drugs for her cancer. Um, I, I drank it in my granddad's cup. Oh, for, it's like three girls in one cup in the worst possible sense. In every possible sense. But anyway, <laughs> all right. Andrew, hold on. It's, we, we were cracking thinking about it. And of course, I, I should, I have to make uh, a correction. It wasn't three beers. Um, and it wasn't three times. It was four times having sex and five bottles of beer. That's, of course, Dennis Mitchell 25 years ago. He said, um, I, I no, also, no. also think when we're going through all those excuses, we have seen people who have had genuine cases where there have been like just a series of, as the book goes or film, depending on your age, a series of unfortunate events do sometimes happen. But Christ, like, when you're making jokes about what's in your system and then you turn out to be caught with something in your system and you came into your fight overweight when the thing you're accused of taking leads to tissue growth and which would obviously have a correlation with an inability to perhaps cut weight in the same way you have previously like also no one sorry I, this, this, i'm just going to labor the point here no one is asking that it's solely on the athlete because this was actually when you've mentioned Sharapova I do remember that was one of the other angles as well it's like yes the only is on the athlete yeah the only is on the athlete to check it absolutely but these are not like this is not an athlete who doesn't have an entire bloody team of people like you don't even if you don't trust one person in your camp have 10 of them check everything you can afford it you can do it because at the end of the day it's your career and it's also he also 
goes on with this big thing and his father go, it's his family around him and his family run his business and his family work for him, not with him, his family work for him. And he talks about that, he employs his family. Surely one of them would know if he's taking the wrong thing. And of course he commented, I took this supplement and then the supplement company came back and said, it's not in it, it can't be in that. Now we saw Simone Hallop do the same thing and get away with it in Cass, even though the supplement company said, it couldn't have been in there. It, they proved it, but you know, so but as you there say, also is the fact that if, if you're in, if a supplement is contaminated, you will have, especially if they're one of the gold label. And when I say gold label, I, like they're the supplements that have gone to the effort to be approved so that there's no question as to what should and shouldn't be in them. If there is something wrong in there that shouldn't be in there, you'll have a case against the supplement company unless they have some sort of very strange ability to write themselves out of liability for cross contamination. It's a bit like, no supplement company is going to say like whenever you go to a restaurant or you might pick up actually oats great example sometimes on the back of a package it will say this is prepared somewhere where you know it, there may be cross contamination with nuts even though the product has no nuts in it if nuts get in there you know what you took the risk there's a risk they've highlighted it no supplement company said by the way there's a there's a risk you might have a steroid or a hormone or something you shouldn't have getting into your system cross contamination in here because if they're in our factory in the first place we're doing something wrong i will say, i will say one thing um <laughs> and so that it's it's I, I learned from working in sports nutrition first and foremost working with with athletes and as an athlete as well i think working sports nutrition went to factories one in poland one in hungary who produce very major brands in europe mm -hmm. and produce um brands for US, the US companies and so on. So they basically pr produce them in Europe for, for you know, easier to basically yeah. sell them. They're not paying tax and so on, and for shipping. One of the, one of the factories, they had the big, big um, basins, basically bowls, where they're pouring in the powders, mixing with mm. coloring and so on. Then like, so these are these are powders. I saw them when they put one in, which was with a kind of a, a product kind of like Jack 3D or Jacked. Yeah. Which is dangerous. One that is... Yeah, yeah, has caused exactly. a lot of failures. Exactly. Um, years. After they did a, a, a sort of a, a white label uh, jacked kind of version for yeah. a, a Turkish company, a Turkish brand, they then poured in on top of, like they basically, they basically filled it out, filled it the, the, yeah. the tins or whatever. Um, then they put in another mix of protein into it. And so I'm like, that's contamination. That was that was in in Hungary. The one in Poland, um, there were there was basically a strawberry protein. Uh, they said you can try some of this when we, we fill it out. Take a uh, 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 bunch of take a little thing home with you. Tub a tub with you. It's like great. And then I noticed there was a there was a sort of a red black thing sort of just sitting there, quite the size of my hand. Yeah. My hand. And I looked and went, oh, and I said, is that just is that, is that clot? Is it condensation? It was very dry. Is it condensation? I said, oh no no no, it's not moisturizing. And then the guy just went and he scooped it out. And it, I still think it, now, it was a giant cockroach. They were importing all their, their protein. There was there were so many levels, grades of protein, grades, sorry. And they were bringing from China and from India, different places. And basically, so it was basically fast. So yeah. I've seen that this can happen, Nisa. It can happen, but not. I think if you're, if you're being, if you're putting yourself and holding yourself out as a business that has gone to the, the standard of being tested for the purposes there you of. Go being allowed to be labeled to athletes as these are your safe brands because those brands are highlighted these are the ones that your federation whether it be if you're an olympic athlete whether it be if you're a boxer you can go to your governing bodies and see these are the products they're saying oh, this, yeah. list, this list here oh, yeah. so if they are contaminated which can happen then you have a way of going sorry we were told this was perfectly safe exactly Nothing here should exactly. have been it. Austrian shouldn't be coming into your system. No, 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 no. Look, there's one, one other one. Um, there's a couple of ones. One is that it shows how the kind of boxing, a lot of boxing journalists in the U in US and some of the UK as well, and boxers as well in the US have kind of I can't say rallied. I, I've some of them have rallied around Juan Garcia, and a lot of them are just basically excusing it. This is one case in point. No weapon against me shall prosper. Keep praying for me because this is just the first attack. Did you support Donald Trump? That's it, brother. Good job, uh, Getting a hug uh, from Sugar Shane Mosley, one of the really outstanding fighters of his age. And a lot of them have right around, a lot of them said, like, oh, God love him. But we see this in all sports. No, no, no. I no. think there's also people don't want to believe 
I, and I, I completely get it. People don't want to believe people are doping, firstly. But I think there's always there's also this particular case, possibly the American mindset. I, I, I do think British journalists have been very strong on this. And I think they were for the main and the vast majority have also been extremely strong with their views on the likes of Conor Ben. So I think there has been a good consistency among the vast majority of British journalists, particularly the higher level ones. I will say that I think in the US we're dealing with a culture that also we have to factor in the fake news aspect, which is the first thing Ryan Garcia came out with. And the fact that one substance, there seems to be a misunderstanding when it's like something initially was in the first test and you go, oh, well, then the testing is wrong. Like Ryan Garcia was going on about the B, his B sample as if he didn't understand as a basic step that it's split from his A, that it's the one sample. Like, I just, the, mind, the mind boggles. But look, we are where we are with this situation. I think what we need to do with these sort of incidents, particularly in combat sports, it has to be zero tolerance. And I was listening to Spencer Oliver talking this week. Spencer Oliver, obviously, um, a British boxer who suffered, um, he was in a coma after his last professional fight. And I think listening to him speak, like he, get, he gets a lot of stick for some of his like kind of, you know, he loves AJ and he's a complete fanboy of AJ. Like that's kind of a running joke on the show um, he's on. And he, he's just, when he speaks about the potential the consequences in the sport and knowing what it's like to suffer such a severe injury and obviously he's gone he's very lucky he's gone full circle from that but he was in a coma as a result of a fight and nothing to do with doping just to be clear on that so when he says there should be zero tolerance you know that he means it and that he understands like zero tolerance in a combat sport is a minimum it is a must Hey, so you whooping O'Malley? <laughs> I've seen that shit. I love that's that right. shit. That's the response needed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I'm like a song just... <laughs> oh, he cannot beat me in boxing. He, he can't even beat me in MMA. Thing is, I've been doing MMA for the past five years, but nobody knows. So you, Nick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always a step ahead, though. I've been doing MMA. I'm gonna do a little eventually, I do a little transition, take take an MMA fight eventually. No, no, win a UFC title. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. When it happens, you heard it here first. Okay. Let's go. Ask around, they know about me.